hearing about level p complexity. Yeah, so level p complexity of Boolean functions. Uh, do tell me if there are any questions or comments on the way. Um, I've been using thin thinning, memoization, and uh, well, symbolic representation of polynomials. And uh, just to get a little bit of a teaser of what it might look like in the end, the, the sort of graph here is of four polynomials, which represent, which I will explain later in more detail, the, the complexity, the what is called the level P complexity of a certain uh, Boolean function. The function is given in the middle of the graph. It's FAC. It's a five bit or five bool function. It takes in five bits and then it checks. It's true if, the first three are not the same, and the last two are the same. So I'm not sure if it's um, uh, visible. If I let's see if I can make a pointer appear here. Uh, sorry, Control One, Control Two. Ah, okay. Uh, do Do you, you see my pointer uh, on the screen? Yes, you said and, but do you mean or? Hmm. I heard Is no comment about fire. seeing my pointer, so I'm not sure if that means... Yes, we, we can uh, see we your see, pointer. Yeah, we see your pointer. And Sam oh. wanted to know, because you said and... Well, and okay, I don't know if you're seeing my or. pointer or not. He can't hear us. <laughs> I got no... Okay, apparently there. you can, uh, can't hear us. Or something is seriously wrong. But um, let's continue. So um, we want to compute... Uh, decision trees for certain Boolean functions. Um, you can't hear us. Yeah, that's true. We can see the pointer, but you can't hear us. Okay. Can you hear me? Then if so, then it's fine. <laughs> okay, good. People are <laughs> nodding. I don't know why Zoom decided that I should now be uh, <laughs> shielded from your chit chat or whatever. Um, anyway, um, I will not try to set, fix the settings right now. If there are more questions, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't actively turn my volume down. Uh, oh, let's see if I can change because I'm not muted. And okay. Okay. we saw the dialogue. Just okay, how did I get yeah. a dialogue? Interesting. Yes. Oh. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. That's Apparently, okay. when I tried to get the the uh, the pointer visible on the screen, there was apparently a magical key button for turning out, uh, turning off the volume, which I've never used before. <laughs> now I learned something new today. <laughs> Great. So let me know when. Good. Okay. Anyway, um, this function FAC has, uh, and I will define what the decision tree is later so, in more detail. Pa Patrick, I, I had a minor question just on the first sure. slide it said it said all but you said and uh okay well it, it's correct here it's or so it's it's, it's okay. true okay. if either those are different or those are the same yeah sorry yeah. Uh, actually the exact example function is not important the only thing that's a bit interesting by this function is that this is this is the simplest function we could find where this that there are competing polynomials, so it's not just one polynomial which wins in the full interval, and and clearly for, for for large more complicated Boolean functions there is very often lots of different competing polynomials, but this is the it seems that this is the smallest uh, n in the number of bits for which we can get this behavior that there are two different polynomials which are competing. Okay, yeah, I, I should have said that this is joint work with Julia Jansson, who is a PhD student in mathematical science and also my doctor. Um, okay, let's move on. So still, there are, this is also about things which we'll define more in detail later, but there are actually 54,000 different decision trees possible for computing this function FAC. And decision tree here is roughly what order you should look at the bits. So the evaluation sort of assumption here is to look at one bit at a time, if it's uh, zero, one, and then you continue from there. And and you can generate all the algebraic structures uh, for a five bit FAC function as a set of decision trees, and you can take, take the size and they get T5, which is 54,000. Now we wanted to compute this for a nine bit function mm -hmm. uh, that was used in Julia's master's thesis, which I wasn't involved in, but when I was reading it, uh, she she had sort of a speculation about what the, the minimal cost would be for that uh, nine bit function, and I was saying saying well 
how wh wh why not check it with the computer that should be easy uh, like fam famous last words so so now i estimated how many trees would we have to sift through to compute that minimum so it's on the order of for a nine bit function nine times the number of trees for that eighth squared which is eight times the number of trees for the t for the for the seventh squared and so on down to this 54000 at t5 which as you might imagine is is a rather big number so you do not want the brute force solution here of generating all the decision trees and then trying to find which of them is the best. That would take to the end of the universe uh, or something like that. Um, but thanks for using thinning memorization and, and comparison of polynomials, we can get in this particular case of the two level majority that she was using in the Mathis thesis, we get down to a singleton set actually of, of polynomials, which just this polynomial. And this is actually not the same as you had as a, as a hypothesis there. It's like 1% um, better or something like that. So it's it's probably negligible for more practical purposes, but it, it's, it's interesting to see that it was actually not the right one, uh, which also means that the, the decision tree, which you had reasoned, in a sort of informal way in a page or two about why that would be the best. Actually, she, she reasoned that these four, there were four functions and one of those had to be the best and she computed which was the best, but neither of those four was optimal. This is slightly better than all of those four. What's the cost of a decision tree? Yes, I will get to that. So this was a teaser, so you know roughly what's about and now will come the more sort of step-by-step -step definitions. Key types, definitions. Um, First, the Boolean function, that's just a function from a tuple of n bits to one bit. And a tuple is just a vector of n bits. And I will write bit or bool interchangeable. I would use the bold phase 0 and 1 for false and true. And a decision tree is a tree-like structure that defines how to evaluate a Boolean function. So if you start by looking at the right-hand side of this slide where the decision tree is graphically depicted, it says, okay, one way of evaluating the three-bit majority function, so the function which just checks which one or zero is in the majority out of three. Uh, so one way of doing that is looking at the first bit, and then depending on if that's zero or one, you go to, in this case, if it's zero, you go to check the third bit. If that's also zero, you're done. Then you know that the result of the function is actually zero, regardless of what bit two might say because you already got two zeros, so the majority is zero. Otherwise, if this is one, you will have to change the check the last bit as well, bit two, and then depending on its value, you will get a zero or one output. So the leaves here are giving the output of the Boolean function, and the sort of paths down the tree uh, show um, what questions you ask if you ask only one bit at a time. So the decision tree is basically a big binary tree, but it, it can stop early. It doesn't need to go all the way down. If it knows the answer early, it can stop there. So um, this seems very much like a binary decision diagram, but restricted to be a tree. Yes, we will use, we will get to binary decision diagrams uh, later. Um, okay. But yes, um, so this this is the, we actually use binary decision diagrams to represent the Boolean functions. Um, we also use them to represent the, the decision trees, but that's uh, we actually don't need to represent the decision trees in the end, because it turns out we confuse the computation of the polynomials into the computation. But uh, yeah, the binary decision diagrams are important there, and then we could also use sharing. Yeah, BDDs have a fixed order, uh, and this has just tried to show that we actually don't have a fixed order here. So we don't, we are not restricted to having a fixed order. So this, in one of the subtrees uses X3, and one of the others, the other subtree uses X2. So usually BDDs, there is a fixed order of the indices, and, and that's used straightforward, straight through. And that's to get nice normal forms and, and better sharing. But the sharing will depend on what order you pick and so on. Okay, OBDDs too. Well, I don't know the details there. Anyway, this is a data type in Haskell. So a decision tree is either a leaf, which I called res, res for result, which gives the Boolean output uh, that decision tree should have. So that's these leaves, the square boxes. And otherwise, it's a node which has an index. That's the one and three and two and so on. And two decision trees, uh, the left and the right hand side. 
So the, the decision, tree, decision tree you get to if you have picked uh, a, a false or a true. And this is the syntactic representation of exactly the same tree as here. So we're now close to defining the cost, but uh, we can get to uh, the actual expected cost slightly later. Any questions so far? Okay, so this is the Haskell data type. And I, I was saying that this is, you know, bool fun takes n bits and so on. So there's lots of information which is not captured here. And for example, the index here could be out of bounds and there could be other structural properties which are not fulfilled. So actually uh, there is an Agda version as well, which is used for, for the proving part. And then I have two indices for the data type of decision tree. So it's actually a family of data type. So I define decision trees relative to a certain Boolean function f on n bits. So I want the tree, I want later to generate all decision trees for a particular function. So that's why this is an index. So then the result constructor here, which here just had a Boolean, now it has the restriction that the index here has to be const. So the function that this decision tree represent has to be the constant function returning b. So that means that, that most places I will not be allowed to use res, but um, when the function is actually constant, I can use the res constructor. Okay, and if it's uh, not constant, then I actually, uh, any um, not constant function will need to have at least one bit. So this is a successor of n. Uh, that f is uh, now. So this is an implicit argument of the function here. And it will return a decision tree of the successor of n size with f as an index. And what are the subtrees? Well, i is an index, which is at most this uh, successor of n then. And then I actually restrict the Boolean function f such that the ith bit is zero. So this computation set bit i zero f you can see the type of set bit here. It takes an index, it takes a bit, a Boolean function of n plus one variables, and then it returns a Boolean function of n variables. So it restricts the Boolean function to a slightly smaller Boolean function by fixing one of the bits. And you can fix it to either zero or one, and those two cases are used in the constructor here. So this means that decision trees for a certain level are defined in terms of decision trees for the level below, but not only that, the functions, the Boolean functions that decision trees has to be trees for, has to be captured in or captured in this invariant. This is a little more complicated type, but uh, yeah, if there are questions, I can take them other way, perhaps. So doesn't it, this uh, set bit function depends on the Boolean function you are representing? Yes. Well, so no, well not the, I mean, set bit is, is, is a general function that takes a function f as an argument. Okay, okay. I, I, I mean, it, it's a function from a Boolean mm -hmm. function to a Boolean function. That's, mm -hmm. that's what it's doing. So it's it basically, so the, yeah. The, the point here is that you can interpret a deck tree as uh, a Boolean function. And when you do, when you interpret the Agda one, you'll get the thing that's in the index, right? Yes, yes, exactly. So if you evaluate this decision tree, you will actually get sort of observationally the same thing as the F you had. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, exactly. So all the decision trees for a function F, if I evaluate them, will actually behave as F. Is the active version going to rule out duplicate indexes in the tree? Uh, actually, yes. So I, I will not do that in my graphical representation, but... Uh, the thing is that this is a decision tree on n bits. So um, I will use, the, the, will, the fin n here will be a smaller and smaller fin the further I go down the tree. Right, so you're basically just, you're, you're deleting the, the current bit. Yeah, so I, I sort of erased this bit and it doesn't exist. There is no way to get a duplicate from, from that reason. So that's one of the reasons I use this, this encoding to make sure that I don't uh, sort of get into trouble by, by duplicates and, and unnecessary lookups of bits I already know the answer to. A good question. And it also means, for example, if, if this wouldn't be successor of n, this uh, fin of n, 
I mean, let's say if this would be zero instead of success extra of n, fin of zero doesn't have any indices. So the pick constructor cannot be used uh, at the lowest level. If there are no bits to pick, then if there are no positions left, then it, the function has to be constant. So there's actually a sort of implicit to split up in this is this is covering the zero bit case, but can come earlier for if the function is constant earlier. But this can only cover the case where there is at least one bit left as an input. But but it can, I mean, so it's not an if and only if. So you you can only put a con you can in res you can only put a constant function, but you could have constant functions at the higher levels as well. Uh, yes, I mean the n here is 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 free. So I can, if the function happens to be constant, already used at n bits, then I can use the rest constructor. Okay, um, let's just look a little bit on this this uh, Boolean subfunction so on. So this decision tree, I call it x1 on the previous slide. Uh, it's for the three-bit majority function, which I call my for majority. Um, and the left subtree, which I will get into more details later, uh, if I set the bit, and position one. Now I use one, two, three here, just instead of the fin data type, just for readability. So if I set the first bit to be zero in the majority, then I'm at this subtree, and the underlying function, the Boolean function that it's left if I set bit one to zero, is actually and. So the only way for majority to return one, if I all know that the, is that one of the indices is zero, is if both the remaining bits are one. So I actually get the Boolean function and as the result here. Correspondingly, if I got a one uh, in the first in investigation of the first bit, then I only need um, one of the, I mean, I, either of those. So this suddenly or then. So this is just exemplifying what the set bit is doing for the majority case. So in the F0, the F function on the left side, is the AND function and the left uh, right side represents the, the OR function. Um, and then the cost of a certain decision tree is a function from a tuple to a natural number, which is just for that tuple, when you start running it, how far down the tree you got before you got an answer. So for example, the cost of the tuple one, one, whatever is two. So it's two levels down, you asked two questions. But if it's one, zero, one, then the cost is three. So these four cases have cost three. This case, which actually represents two different tuples has cost two, and this also has cost two. So you can evaluate uh, a decision tree and a tuple to a natural number. And then we get to the expected cost. Uh, so finally, if we have a decision tree, we can compute a polynomial in the probability that a certain bit is a one. Well, actually, I assume here that we have n independent bits, all probability p to be one. And um, what it does then is, is it's computing, I mean, at least conceptually, it's computing the expected value over the two to the power of n different tuples weighted by the probability of that tuple appearing. So, I mean, this one zero one here has a certain probability, which is like p squared times one minus p. And then there's depth three for that one. And then this has uh, another probability. This is p times p and, and depth two and so on. So it's a big sum of, of uh, products of probabilities and, and uh, values, at least uh, conceptually that is. It's much more efficient to actually compute it. So the expected cost of the example we had actually turns out to be this polynomial. So this is a constructor for polynomials. This is a list of coefficients starting with the constant term, the x term, the x squared term. And this, <laughs> I didn't have time to do this in the pretty way, so I just wrote it down and took a copy. This is what the what the actual output looks like for for this case. So the the cost as a function of the probability is two times one plus p times one minus p just happens to be for this majority. So it has a maximum in the middle. It has a minimum of two at the ends. Well, I didn't put the, the numbers here, but that's that what, it, what it's doing. And these kinds of polynomials is what I'm trying to compute. And actually, we want to compute the best polynomial out of these 54,000 or whatever it was for FAC. And, and I mean, billions and billions of, of uh, decision trees for the 9-bit the function. 
would do you care about the case where you might have different probabilities for the different bits uh, not in this talk uh, but the you if you have uh, the general case of all the bits having independent but uh, still different probabilities p1 to pn then uh, it turns out that the, the the sort of n variable polynomial you'll get there is is uh, it's a little bit boring because it's uh, you know it's all different ways of multiplying it's basically it's just a representation of the of the function again um because you will get one term for for each combination of of p1 and times 1 minus p2 times p3 times 1 minus p4 and so on so it's going to be a very boring uh, function but yes that that's you could say that this is the special case when you set all of those to p and then you could have even more complicated things when there is also uh, they're not independent but the relations between them but uh, yeah so you could say that you uh, can have a truth table right and the problem i mean this n bit n well polynomial with n variables is just representation of the truth table right with yeah. p or minus one yeah it sort of becomes a, a, what, isomorphic to the truth table or something like that so it's it's uh, and what your polynomial is because they all p or probability are the same you just sum them up right so yeah exactly so it's so expected value lots of these are summed up so it becomes a, a, a one argument polynomial in the end okay, okay. um and this is just a few slides to illustrate a little better this thing I was saying before. I'm not sure if this thing is, is there something in the way at the top of the screen? No, all yeah, good. We can read okay. the entire slide. Good, good, great. So the majority function, uh, if I pick index one, two, or three, and I set that position to zero or one, zero or one, and so on. So the superscript here is the index I picked. And the subscript is the bit I've set. So this is a short annotation for set bit. Oh, now this came up again. Set bit I, B of the majority function. Um, so then, as I mentioned earlier, we get and and or uh, actually for whatever I we pick, because the majority function is what's called symmetric. It doesn't depend on, on what index we do. So it's completely, um, well, it doesn't care about that. But we get two different functions if we set it to zero or one. So it could be six different, but in this case, we get just two. And if we call them and two and or two to get the more readable diagram, and I simplify the diagram a bit so that we put three different arrows from majority function to this choice of zero or one, then we can represent this uh, this part. So I just wanted to give the sort of the full tree-like structure, uh, basically a, a directed graph of uh, the different choices so and is also symmetric it doesn't matter which bit we look at if we look at bit one or bit two we either get const zero so const false if one of the arguments is false and the identity if one of the arguments is true um, so this is just using set bit again but on the on the and function so this is showing where we so if we sort of got a tree here that we're building up a tree of Boolean functions of smaller and smaller arity. So this is a three bit, two bit, one bit functions. And uh, I'll skip this a little quicker to just summarize it. So here I just ignore the three arrows from majority and just sort of capture the main structure. That's a majority on three bits goes down to and and or, this goes down to const zero identity and const one. And then on the zero bit level, it's const zero and const one. There's not much choice there. So this is the, the structure for the particular example of majority on three bits. Um, and the, the way that the computation later will be set up is that for each of these functions, we would generate a set of decision trees. And then we would tabulate that so that we get a set at this point, a set at here point, a set here. And, and notice this is just two nodes here because they're equal, but we had potentially six different so in the, in the general case, we got some function. We split it up into n different cases. And each case, we got a 0, 1, and 1 bit. So we got actually two n, n minus 1 bit functions to choose from. Some of them may be the same. They can all be different. And then from each of them, we will get n minus 1 times 2, n minus 2 bit functions, and so on, all the way down. So this can be a lot of functions. 
And depending on the symmetries of the function, some of these may end up being the same, or lots of them may be the same as for the majority. But in general, it's it's this kind of call graph that we're looking at. It will all end up at, at these constant zero and constant fung one at some place. Okay, so now towards more Haskell-y part, um, we abstract from the actual type for Boolean functions uh, to a type class. So we call it Boofun for Boolean function. It's a type BF. And now we've sort of let go of the Agata part and we just code this in Haskell. So we need two operations. Uh, the minimal thing we need for this is two operations. One is checking if a function is constant. That could in general be an expensive operation. I mean, if it really represented a function from a tuple, I would have to check in two to the power of n different tuples. But as I represent them as BDDs, binary distance diagrams, um, it will be a, a constant time check if it's a constant function or not. I can just check if it's equal to const zero or const one. Uh, it returns a maybe bool here. So if it's just true or just false, that means the function is constant. If it's nothing, it means it's not constant. So that I need. And I also need this set bit function that gives, given an index and a Boolean and a Boolean function, restricts that Boolean function and returns a Boolean function of one less bit. And this is also a, a, a nicely efficient operation on binary decision diagrams. So even though I actually implement this using just one type, I only have one instance, it's still useful to have this type class in, in, the, in between because it makes it sort of the, the types a little prettier. Okay. Um, similarly, on the other side, I'm, I'm, I'm this I'm consuming a Boolean function. I'm constructing decision trees. So on the decision tree side, I need a tree algebra, a decision tree algebra with this result and pick indices, uh, pick functions. So I could downcase the previous example. I had pick and pick and rest with uppercase things. Now I can write it with lowercase constructors and generate a polymorphic value of type A for any A, which is a tree algebra. So the initial algebra is one instance, the decision tree data type, which I will just, uh, and but also you can do cost functions or these expected costs, which are actually polynomials. Uh, so this is the overview and I will get three slides showing the three instances because they are short and nice. So decision trees, we already saw before, uh, it's just these constructors, which match the types of this, uh, these uh, type class. So I can just say that one instance of tree alg is tree decision trees. And then res is the capital res and, and the pick is pick. So then this com this value can be evaluated as a syntax tree. So that's one possible value of it or one possible type of it. Uh, then otherwise I can decide to have this cost function that we talked about earlier. So a function from a tuple to an integer as an instance of the tree algebra. So I can immediately, when I know that this is a constant function, say, okay, a constant function doesn't require any questions to determine its results. So that's the constant zero, uh, whatever the tuple comes in. And correspondingly, if I have the cost functions z0 and c1, I can just say that given a tuple, it's one question for this index, and then I recurse or I, I call C1 or C0 depending on um, if it was true or false. Okay, so this means that I can actually evaluate this same expression either as a syntax tree or as the function which computes its cost just by changing the type signature. And what I will actually use uh, later on is the expected cost. So I mentioned the expected cost is actually polynomial. Here I don't have n, the degree as an index, I only have the type of the ring, the underlying coefficient ring. And here, well, the expected cost for a constant function is also zero as the for any tuple, it's going to be zero. And then it, you can uh, realize that this you can compute from the probability. So it's one so this is then the polynomial one, <laughs> the constant polynomial one. And then it's one minus P, if I would write it. Um, so XP here is just a, a, the polynomial X, sort of. <laughs> uh, so the, the one with a zero constant term and then one in terms in front of the probability. So with, with probability one minus P, we should go to the left 
sub cost and the probability p we should go to the right sub cost and this sum them up so this is sort of the linearity of expected value that we're using here but the interesting thing so pa yes, patrick yes. you've done this as um uh basically shallow embeddings but you could also mm -hmm. just have done it to fold over the algebraic yes. data type right yes yeah are you going to tell us why you did it this way eventually mm. well i mean why it's it's just com convenient i mean actually this this type tree alg a for all a tree alg a arrow a that is the initial data type it's just not a syntactic version of it this is like whatever it's called something encoding of it it's a church, church encoding church of encoding it. of it yeah so so this well, is <laughs> this is the way of one way of encoding the the initial algebra and it's convenient yeah. because i can just then describe my sort of my algorithms in a way that can data choose if i want them to be syntax trees or something else so i sort of well, the fold is built into the value encoding bomber dutch encoding to be yeah. I mean, to be correct yes it's, so also, for it's going to be more efficient this way isn't it or possibly it's, it's, i wouldn't you, wouldn't you, be sure yeah, about it yeah. but at least it's very convenient <laughs> that i can actually go completely ignore the generation of the syntax tree as i can just go directly to generating the polynomials and, yeah, and that's yeah, i think uh, in Haskell, it's normally more efficient because it doesn't have to materialize the yeah it, it will yeah it, it, but it might they might fuse away the other thing as well so I, i'm not sure i haven't compared them because what doesn't really matter here what matters here is that we can get rid of as many decision trees as possible as early as possible because we get this ridiculous number like 10 to the power of 89 and so on otherwise so everything so that's not, not wise, because of your shallow embedding that's, no no you, exactly that so whatever i'm saying that's why the the efficiency of this or not is not the, the key i just did it because i yeah. thought it was a cute way of doing it i think it is a cute way of doing it um but it's hard to understand i mean it's easy to understand for a haskeller who's seen this before but harder to understand by anyone who yeah. is not a haskeller or hasn't seen shallow embeddings before yeah from a presentation well, point for, of view it might be easier to do elsewhere. You know, otherwise. it's kind of, I mean, what I call Douglas final. If I do it in ML, I would just use a signature, right? And signature looks exactly as algebra. Well, I mean, by design of ML. Hmm. Sure, but there's so a, there's much here, much lower, then, you know, lower tech ways of doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I you know, advantage of ML is because it was, well, influenced by algebra, right? By Gauguin. And so it looks like, you know, standard mathematical text. This is a signature. This is an algebra, and so it's all. Yeah, but you—I mean, you, you could do it as an algebraic data type and a recursive function, and that's obvious to anybody who's seen any functional programming without needing to know mm. fancy features like signatures or like type classes. Yeah. Well, it depends on if you ML programmer, then signature is very. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, if you're a I, I, Haskell I programmer, think... then type classes are very straightforward. But yeah. if you're not a Haskell programmer, <laughs> then type classes are an obstacle. And if you're not an ML programmer, then signatures are an obstacle. Yeah. I, I think I should move and... on because uh, yeah, sorry, I, I sh I've probably taken too much time already. Um, I would sort of not give this well too many details, but basically, what we want to use this complex computer complexity of a certain Boolean function. So, given a Boolean function, we compute a set of tree algebra thingies which could be then decision trees but it could also directly be these polynomials um, or the cost functions or whatever they actually we will only use it in the case of polynomials later and then we should kind find some kind of uh, minimal um actually small in, in parentheses s because i'm not guaranteeing that we get the smallest possible set here because that depends on on it might be more complicated getting the actual smallest, but it's for for several of the cases I've done, it's it's small enough. And very, it's interesting because you very early find that you haven't done it right if you don't get the small enough sets because of this squaring of the sizes when you go up and so on. So suddenly it just takes ages to compute it. So either it just done or it take ages if you do it wrong. So anyway, the the, the complexity is basically uh, compute all algorithms uh, take the minimum with the expected cost and then uh, compute well the map of the set the expected cost function which is of course a bit silly and doing it this way but that's one way of describing it so this minimal the reason it's still a set is because this is a pre-order so it might not be a 
but it's not a necessarily a single smallest thing, but you get a set of things which cover the rest. So it's I will not get into the details here of the of the sort of ordering and so on, but uh, that could be for another talk. Um, so we can push the map of expected cost inside the min width. So then we get min width identity, and we do the mapping before. So we generate lots of algorithms, and then we convert them to to its cost polynomials. And this is actually much more efficient because there are many fewer cost polynomials than there are decision trees. If nothing else, then the, if you remember the, the function that computed the cost polynomial from two subtrees, ignored the index. So it only uses the sub polynomials. So um, that means that at least a factor of n reduction in for an n bit function, and that recursively goes on. So it's a, a big reduction. Um, next step is then to say, well, actually, if we compute the expected cost anyway of the generating decision trees, we can just generating this is gen poly is actually equal to gen alg it's just an other instance uh, because you can instead of generating a decision tree and computing the cost you can generate the cost directly you're gen computing the polynomial directly and then i apply uh, some things from from jeremy's uh, bird's book on on i mean like i can insert a thinning step here if i find a suitable ordering uh, the thinning doesn't need to reduce uh, to a truly minimal things, so I still have the minimal minima minimization afterwards. And I haven't done the proof yet because I got stuck in, in lots of intricacies because I wanted to do this in Agada. <laughs> Famous last words, perhaps, I'm not sure. Um, but I can push then the thinning uh, into the recursive structure of the gen poly. So I can do the thinning at each level. And this is a major, and this is where you get from like 10 to the power of 89 to, to five or so uh, it's elements in the set you end up with. And this is the, the main function, the generation of these algorithms. So let's look at it. It fills a, a slide, but it actually fit, fits on a slide. So that's nice. So we start from an n-bit function f, Boolean function. We check if it's constant. If it's a constant function, then there is only way, one way of building a correct decision tree, and that's the res b. So that's a singleton set of res b. So that could be a polynomial or a decision tree um, with the leaf of the decision tree. So that's the easy case. And if it's not a constant function, then we have to do some work. If it's not a constant function, then we want to do this thing with a, the n different uh, the n different, this is the i dot dot n here, the n different possible indices to start looking at. So you want to try all possibilities of starting to look at bit one, bit two, bit three, and up to bit n. And this is now using a helper function cross sigma and the usual cross, which is the Cartesian product of sets. But just recursive structure wise, this calls itself gen alg on an n minus one bit Boolean function which is the, the old friend set bit here. So set bit i zero f is another Boolean function of n minus bit and set bit i one f is the other. So there's sort of n two times n Boolean functions. So the two times n recursive calls to gen alg. Each of these generate a set of decision trees or a set of polynomials. So I take the cross product here, which gives me a t0 and a t1 and an i. So the cross sigma now is is some kind of, uh, well, it's like a monadic bind roughly. Uh, so you, you take a set A, you take a function that generates another set for each value in A, and then you just apply the operator to all x and y, which comes from the first set or the generated set. So this is uh, basically a sum of products uh, so I, I can write it mathematically in, in sort of a big sigma and so on. And I apply this, this uh, algebra function pick here. So it, it's, it's sort of everything is condensed down into this function. And this function works for very small Boolean functions. I should add also that, that inserting thinning is just you, you do the thinning in, the re, in connection with the recursive course. So you, you get a, a set and you thin it and then you start doing the cross products and so on. Um, questions there? 
Okay, so anyway, this one can, in theory, at least generate these uh, mil billions of billions of, of algorithms, or it could just generate a, a rather small set, depending on um, how many different uh, functions are generated out downstairs. Okay, we have this unfold structure, uh, which is the Boolean function. So we, we either we're at the end, or we can split it up into two n subfunctions, and. Um, yeah, I, I already sort of indicated that this could be an enormous number of function calls, which means that we would like to use memoization to avoid recomputation. So memoization reminder, uh, if we naively compute the Fibonacci function by two recursive calls here, then this will have two recursive calls, this will have two recursive calls, so we will be on the order of two to the power of n calls to evaluate the Fibonacci function. Basically, it would be Fib n calls, or Fib n plus one, or something like that. So ridiculously many calls. But if you memoize it, if you, while doing it, fill in a table indexed by n, then it would be linear time instead. And similarly, we should be able to apply that in our case. So we just, I put it in quotes here, need to tabulate the result of the calls. So we need to, for each sub function that we generate, we need to have an entry in some table. And the challenge is just that the input is now a Boolean function, it's not a natural number. So natural numbers are easy to put in a, <laughs> to store in an array and it uses an index for an array, but the Boolean function is a little bit less obvious. Fortunately, hints and others, we have these generic tries and memo tables can be written, done using them. There is a hackage library. I won't show the code here. But if we put all those components together, so we have the gen arg, we add thinning, we add memoization, and we use it for polynomials. Actually, it turns out that for the, our desired function, the nine bit majority function, which would have billions and billions of decision trees, it actually turns out that we only get one polynomial. And the, by the construction of the, the way it's set up, uh, this polynomial is then covering all the other polynomials. Now, I, this, this is the polynomial which, which was sort of beating by 1%, the one in Julia's thesis. So uh, I don't have, I haven't finished the proof. So I can't be completely sure that's the best one, but I, I do think it is. And clearly, as you see, it's just a bunch of numbers. You can't look at it and say, oh, of course, that's the right one. You, not if you draw it either. Uh, I should say, perhaps, the two level iterated majority, this my two thing, is just take nine bits split them into three groups of three, compute the majority in each group, and then the majority of the majorities. So it's, it's related to in the voting systems so when, when you have sort of the winner takes it all in all the sub units, and then you have the majority on the next level. Um, so, and you know from, from sort of politics that that means that you can win the majority two comp competition without having the actual voter majority. You can you can have slightly less than half, or in, in the in the limit case, you can have like 25.1% and still win uh, the majority. Anyway, um, I will say a few words about comparing polynomials, uh, because it's a little fun here that first, I mean, you know, I, I wanted to compute this, this just took ages, it didn't finish for the function we wanted it. And then I implemented memoization. I implemented thinning. And I thought, oh, now, now everything would just fall out. And then I realized, oh, how do I compare polynomials? So this, this complexity is, is a polynomial. And uh, actually, P is less than or equal to Q if for all X in the interval 0 to 1, for all probabilities between 0 and 1, if I evaluate the polynomial at X, it's less than or equal to evaluating it at 1, uh, at the Q at X. So clearly, some polynomials cross each other, and then neither of them is uniformly better than the other. So it might come out at the end, several crossing polynomials. And I had that example on the very first slide when I had four candidates which crossed each other in different ways. And that was the output of my algorithm for the FAC function. Uh, mathematically, then, this question, how do I implement this? So I sort of said, OK, I did some ad hoc special cases looking at the coefficients and then sort of, OK, this is, seems to be positive. And you know, it's, it's just a partial comparison anyway. Maybe it works. It didn't work. It was still taking. I mean, I, I, didn't, I don't know how long it would have taken with the ad hoc version. It just took more than overnight. And, and when you fix it to, to do the actual exact comparison, it takes a second or less than a second. 
So this is now polynomial algebra and root counting. I would just say a few words, but the interesting thing is that, so first I, I said, we, we, can, we can compute the difference of the two polynomials and then just check if that's greater than equal to zero. So the whole problem of comparing comp polynomials becomes checking if a polynomial is strictly positive or not. Well, actually, if it's greater than or equal to zero or not. So if if I can determine that a polynomial has no root in the zero one interval, then I only need to check one point to know that the function is on the one side or the other. I can just check p of zero, for example, because if it has no root, if it's positive there, it has to be positive everywhere. So that's a very nice thing. It requires me to be able to check if it has no roots. So then if it has a single root, or actually if it has several single roots, then it definitely is not comparable. Then one polynomial is better in one region and worse in another. So they are incomparable in this order. Uh, finally, if there is a double root, if it just touches, then we're back at basically the no root case. I, I, it's enough to check one point, and if it's positive there, it's going to be greater than or equal to zero everywhere. So this means that if I have an algorithm which computes for me the exact number of roots with multiplicities in the interval zero to one, I can answer the question of whether or not p is less than or equal to q exactly. And basically, it's, if, if we only have even order roots, then, then we're fine. So MD could be fourth order or sixth order, whatever. So you do have to make sure that the thing you check is not the root, a root. Yes. Right? Yeah. So that's that, that the only thing which is still ad hoc is that I, I check a few places because I, I'm not quite sure how to, uh, in a structured way, make sure that I check sufficiently many places. But that ad hocness does not hurt the performance, it seems. But yes, true. So for example, sometimes it has a double root in zero or in one and so on, that's rather common. And then I have to be a little bit careful not just to check the endpoints. Um, anyway, just the, the short thing here is that there is an algorithm called Yun's algorithm for square free factorization. I can compare, I can compute the GCD of a polynomial and its derivative to find out if it has a double root and so on. And doing this recursively gives you all the multiplicities and so on. And then there's a, they call something called the Kutch rule of signs to combine, to, to, to count the number of roots in an interval without actually solving it. And the interesting thing is not solving it is really important here. Because if you think, what would solving this and, and computing the root mean? Because doubles are not exact. Rationals are not enough. Because normally polynomials of a degree two or more don't have rational roots, not, not, don't all have rational roots. So I really need um, to, to do this. I, I need to do this without having to compute the exact numbers. And it's enough actually to have the count of the number of roots in the interval. So using interval halving and the cut strudel science, you can do this. So to sum up then, thinning memorization, exact comparison of polynomials, for the majority function that we wanted to start, the iterative majority, we get a singleton set. For this FAC, we get a set of four polynomials left. And um, yeah, future work, clean up the calculation, make sure the proof goes through. Uh, make the memorization even more efficient. I've noticed some things doesn't seem to be completely as it should be. I think I need one memorization table per level instead of per function or a combination there. and. Doing that, it might be possible to actually get to the 27-bit three-level iterated majority, which I don't think has been computed. So yeah, that's it. Questions? Thanks, Patrick. Um, I have a question about, so this gives you the polynomial, but um, it will be quite interesting to have the tree as well. Yes, the decision tree. Um, so I, I can say directly there. So it's actually rather in, in, um, easy to make a pair uh, instance. So if you have two instances for this uh, tree alg class, you can make an instance for a pair. Yep. And then you can choose to do the thinning on the, prol the polynomial components and keep the decision tree on the side. Right, OK. And then this will arbitrarily break ties Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you will get, uh, the, 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 I think you can also make an instance with a 
with a polynomial and all the trees for that polynomial. But I haven't done that one because that doesn't fit quite into the thinning structure. Then I would have to uh, ch change that a little bit. But it, it should fit in there. It just didn't so far. So it should be possible to compute all the polynomial, all the decision trees which match a certain polynomial uh, while doing it. Now there seems okay, to be other questions, or maybe there was the same question. I'm not sure because now the hands are gone. There's lots of gossip in uh, the chat. So can I can I ask uh, something uh, of methodological nature? So you say you haven't finished the proof of thinning because you're doing it in Agda. Have you done it on paper? Uh, not really. I mean, so I, I'm, I'm convinced it's true, but I. <laughs> so, for example, I, from what I remember, uh, uh, Jeremy uh, would try to do this on paper and would uh, at the same time uh, check it with quick check. Hmm. So, have yeah. you tried? Uh, to, have you tried using quick check to to test uh, the the assumptions and so on? Well, so. Um... I'm right, Jeremy. Wouldn't you have done this? Wouldn't you have yes, tried it, to so, put so yeah. it, it, um, If it were in the book, there would be there would be some pen and paper calculations and some quick check confidence boosting checks. Hmm. We, we are still waiting for the code, by the way, which is supposed to come soon. Which which code? <laughs> So it's the same code that I've sent oh, both of oh. you independently. Ah, ah okay, yeah, <laughs> but, the code um, of Jeremy. Both of yeah. both of who? Both of yeah. who? Cesar and Patrick. No, Cesar didn't get any such code. I oh, didn't you? I thought I'd sent you no. the zip file. I'm sorry, I'll send you the zip file. It's um, okay, it needs thanks. tidying, then you'll get the untidy version. Uh, All right, thanks. So, but this is why well, you haven't tried that. Uh, well, so I, I've done some quick checking and so on but uh, mm -hmm. i haven't uh, um i mean on the way I discovered lots of bugs for example when we had the ad hoc version of the polynomial comparison uh, it was in several cases it was actually not really doing the right thing it not only wasn't sufficiently often saying the right thing but it was also sometimes occasionally saying the wrong thing um, oh. so um, but actually, having to look up these different algorithms for doing the polynomial factorization so properly also removed most of the bugs. There was just this this uh, corner cases, but Jeremy mentioned them. I and mean, uh, when when it's zero, when you actually happen to look at the root for a double root, and then you don't know, uh, that was the, the basically the remaining cases. Right. Thanks. I have another question. Uh, what was Julia's master's thesis about? Well, it was about uh, computing uh, sort of these polynomials for for or different different notions of complexity for several different Boolean functions generated from graphs and and percolation and things like that. I'm not sure. I didn't dive into the details, but yeah, <laughs> the inspiration for this was when reading this one and a half page argument for why one of the four algorithms, decision trees that she had found for, for this majority, two, two level majority would be the best ones. And I wasn't convinced so that she wrote a corollary instead of proof. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then we started and then I said, oh, it should be easy to implement. And then, you know, it took two months because of the fact it was just a, such a sheer number of, of different things. So I needed, I mean, I really needed both memoization and thinning and correct comparison polynomials to get it down complexity wise to, to something that's computed in the second. It's very, it's very nice. But so how did, how did she come up with the four candidate? Um... It was, was arguments like, well, you know, first it doesn't, but there's some symmetries. There are quite a few symmetries in this iterated majority. So like, it doesn't matter which of the three groups you start with. So yep. you can always start, you can just decide one is the one you start with, and it doesn't matter which first bit in each group you start with. So then it also reduces yep. the number yep. of possibilities quite a bit. But it turns out it thinks that it, it seems that this one is a bit of an of a strange algorithm because it, it starts in one block and then sometimes it switches to another block because it sort of says, oh, this is now unlikely. It be, be, so it switches over before it you know the answer because it's sort of it's more likely to get a a decisive answer by sw swapping somewhere else than to stay on. And 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 you you know that it's not just picked one of many different uh, entirely equivalent orderings. Well, I, I'm picks. I'm sure there are there are lots of equivalent orderings of picks, but uh, 
I, I, so I this so is strictly I, strictly yeah. better than anything that does a more a, a more obvious schedule. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's this this covers all the others. Yeah. Okay. I look forward to seeing the paper eventually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have a, a higher level question, which is just what was the the motivation for this? Was this voting systems or something else? Well, I would say mostly, you know, this is from the mathematics department, so they're just curious on, on computing stuff. And... <laughs> Uh, so I, I don't know what the, up, the story for behind it was because uh, he, he was a the, the supervisor was a famous professor there and he sort of suggested this and she thought it sounded interesting and then yeah but yes voting system is is but I, mean, I think it's a bit a long shot because if you really want to use it for voting systems then it's not like uh, three bits times two levels <laughs> you, you you need a little more bits I think <laughs> Any, any other questions or, or comments? So you are completing the set, the family set with physicists, computer scientists, and now mathematicians. 